resume the recording and yes so today we're talking American wine sorry my notes are a little bit old so if you have any um, anything that you want to add anything that you might see that's wrong in the notes remember I'm not the master sommelier I'm just a certified level 2 sommelier so please please add your notes this is meant to be interactive so that everyone um, studies and gets something out of it so we're gonna talk American wine today and I'm super excited to talk about my hometown we'll get started in three minutes three minutes So we still have some people joining. Welcome, Aang. How are you? Yes, let me see. Oh, I'm okay. I totally forgot it was Thursday. <laughs> Thank goodness my alarm went off. I'm like, study group. <laughs> I know, and I've been going crazy with things. So, like, you know, I've been working in LA too. And so. Yeah, yeah and you I'm were up at like 3 o'clock in the morning. That is so scary. I don't know how I you know. did that. Yeah, and then I slept, so I'm good now. Oh, okay. I'm Wait a second. Oh my God. All right. So we're going to get started in one minute. One minute. We're just waiting for everybody to join. I think this might be our group and we are almost just ready. Um, so who's, do you have someone talking? Um, tell, tell no, me. no. Today. It's all about it. Today. I don't have anyone talking just because. I've been so crazy busy that I didn't schedule anyone for today, but we'll be back next Thursday with a guest speaker. Today, I am going to talk, we are going to talk, we are going to talk, and we're going to talk today about American wine. So I have a slideshow presentation with some notes that we can kind of guide us, but if you guys have anything to add that you know about American wine, please, you know, add it. Um, it's a really important region. It's the fourth largest producing region in the world. And yeah, it's number one in consumption, I think, right now. Give it up for the Americans for drinking like crazy, right? Are you right, talking so like American, like all over America, or specifically like Napa, Sonoma? Are you talking just everywhere in America? About the American wine market, which um, historically, you know, like right now, current day, it's all about California, right? Yeah. So California produces 90% of the wine. It has Napa Valley, which is iconic, but right. it didn't start in, I mean, it started in California, but that's not where the bulk of it actually got its roots and really started. So we're going to talk about the history of, Calif of American wine, and then we'll talk about the different regions that are producing wine in America. So... It's a whole American wine class. So I hope you guys are ready for this. Just a thumbs up or some kind of like post to let me know that you're there. Okay. All right, so um, you guys, we are going to get started. Um, I am going to share my presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. Just bear with me for a quick second. You know, it never wants to share at the right moment. Let me see. Bye-bye out of here and go here. I think I just have way too many things that are open. Um, sorry, guys. I thought I was ready. And back to Zoom. Now I should be able to share it. All right, here we go. So this is actually a presentation that I did for the students over at PYDA because I volunteer with them a couple times during the year and I teach an American wine class. Well, I teach an American wine class. I teach a 
six noble grapes wine class and I do a lot of other things with them but so this is me telling them about American wine and I'm going to share it with you guys and if you have comments if you have anything to add if you feel like something is wrong in the presentation please just raise your hand put something in the chat and we'll get started all right so who's excited I'm excited about my hometown um, so we are going to talk about wine and this is an overview of wine in the entire USA we're going to talk about the history some of the laws that affect the US wine market and then some of the major regions that are in the US so let's get started um, so a little bit of the history so America has this sordid past with the history of wine it's like a love-hate relationship so basically in the 1770s um, that's when missionaries actually went to the United States and you know missionaries of course we love missionaries I mean not I'm very religious of course but I love missionaries because they're the ones who actually would go to different cities around the world and when they would set up a mission they used to always plant wine grapes in America was the same way so they came to America and they set up their mission and then what they first thing they did was plant wine grapes because they used these wine grapes um, this wine juice for religious ceremonies and so a per very important person is Juniper Sarah. Um, I'm probably saying his name wrong. It's probably Juniper Pero Sarah, but um, he planted mission grapes and mission grapes were planted all over California, all over the U.S. for the most part, especially in Missouri, Texas, and New Mexico. So that pretty much became the main grape that they were using to make wine and they used it for religious purposes. And then what happened was in the 1800s, there was this big fur trade. So people came to California to kill bears and to get fur. I mean, it's not a very pretty reason that they came, but they came. And then they also started to plant more um, grapevines. And they actually bought over the European grapevines, Ventimus Venera, right? So mission grapes come from a different grape than Ventimus Venera. Ventimus Venera those are the grapes that we love because those are the grapes that produce the most alcohol, right? So, um, they bought over the Ventimus Venera grapes and then they started to make wine out of these grapes. And the first winery to do that was Buena Vista Winery, which still exists in California today. Um, and this guy, um, Agustin Harasadi, guys could probably say his name better it's in the presentation but he's known as the father of viticulture because he bought these grape varietals over and then in Ohio it was important in Ohio because they had the first commercial winery so like I said back from the 1770s they were making wine pretty much in all the states that existed at that time um, so they were making winery wines in Ohio and then they had their first commercial winery in Ohio and then in Missouri they started to produce wines and Missouri was actually second to California in wine production so Missouri is a very important state when you think about the history of wine um, I actually have a really good friend that just opened up a tasting room in Missouri so yeah give it up give it up for Jenny Don Sellers um, so that was the 1800s, the fur trade, Buena Vista, and then you have the gold rush. So of course the gold rush brings this whole new element and this new excitement to the wine industry. And they were completing the railroads, so a lot of people moved to San Francisco. Um, the population of San Francisco actually doubled and it just became this major city. Um, and people, of course, they have money because they have gold and what do they drink? They drink wine. So the wine industry really took off between 1848 and 1855. It was booming. People were buying wine in all the states that existed at that time. So then, um, hold on for a second, somebody's trying to get in. Let me just send them the link, I'm sorry. And, okay, and so then it was taken off in America with all the wine and everything. And then what happened was, um, phylloxera. So phylloxera is this little bug 
that ruined the wine industry worldwide, right? And so it ravaged the American wine industry like grapevines. It just destroyed them. Like it, it killed so many grapevines that a lot of wineries were like, you know what? We're just going to go out of business. We can't fight it. It's this little bug that infects the wineries. And this happened in 1860. And literally, it was worldwide. So after that, it was like they had to build all over again. And some wineries decided to build all over again. And then some of them just kind of gave up. Well, the ones that decided to build all over again, you know, they lasted for like 40 years, 60 years, and then in 1919, you have Prohibition, which um, South Africa, Cape Town during level five, level four was kind of like Prohibition for me, but <laughs> luckily it didn't last that long, right? So Prohibition lasted from 1919 to 1933, and basically it was illegal to sell or to buy alcohol um, they basically, you see them pouring alcohol down the drain, which is like hurts my heart, but um, it, it just kind of killed the wine industry. The only people that were able to function were the people who were making wine for religious purposes. And so even in Los Angeles, Los Angeles was full of vineyards. Um, it would probably look so different today if they hadn't had prohibition. Like Los Angeles might look a little bit like... Um, Bordeaux or like Champagne or something like that if they didn't have prohibition. So they have prohibition. All these wine people, including the areas outside of San Francisco, the areas in Los Angeles, the areas in Missouri, Ohio, they all like, you know, pulled up their vines and said, let's plant apples or let's do something else with this. You know, then the Industrial Revolution came, so maybe they opened up a factory. So that really hindered the wine industry in the United States. And then, so Prohibition is over, we start making wine again. So they're making wine in California, um, they're making wine in Missouri, but California really takes off. Like we really start to take this seriously. We have the perfect climate for it, we have the perfect weather for it, and we start making really delicious wines. However, nobody in the world took us seriously. So remember, America was kind of like behind in the eight ball because during 1919 and 1933, we weren't making any wine. They are making wine in Paris and France and Italy, but in America, we weren't making any wine. So when we did start making wine, they kind of looked at us and they were like, uh, they don't really know what they're doing. They're cowboys. You know, California wines tend to be super high alcoholic. Because of the weather conditions, they tend to be very, very fruit forward. So around the world, we had a reputation of making like cowboy wines. And then in 1976, the Judgment of Paris happened, right? Judgment of Paris, I just literally want to get a tattoo. There's so many tattoos that I want to get that are wine related. But 1976 changed the game for the wine industry for America, for California. There was this blind tasting. We sent um, wine from Chateau Montalina, wine from Stag's Leap, and... Um, it actually won in this wine tasting competition against wines in Paris. And it was like this world, like it was, it was crazy. It was like a really big deal at the time because no American wines had ever won. And we beat out two American wines, beat out two French wines in the judgment of Paris in 1976. And that basically put us on the map as a wine producing country where they finally started to take us seriously. So that's the history of American wine. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they would like to add about that history of American wine? Just unmute yourself and talk. I can't really see the comments with my screen. All right. Oh, so we'll move on. So now let's just talk about like a couple. Wait a second. Um, can we still take uh, the, the two wines that won in 76? Do they still like, are they still around? Yeah, they are still around. So like Chateau, Chateau Montalena. Yeah, they still have a winery in Napa Valley and it's a really beautiful estate. Um, wow. It's history. So of course, and then Stag Sleep still exists. That's, even yeah, that it's confusing because there's Stag Sleep with an apostrophe and then there's Stag Sleep. So you have to make sure that you're getting the right Stag Sleep. Okay. Um, but they definitely do exist still. Their bottles are in the Smithsonian. I didn't wow. know that, but it makes sense that they are in the Smithsonian. Yeah, it's right. part of American history now, so. <laughs> it is, right? And like, oh gosh, could you imagine if you had a bottle of that Chateau Montalino? Crazy. <laughs> Um, so some fun facts about the American wine culture. Um, almost the entire lower 48 states 
um, are in the sweet spot for making wine. They're between the 30 and the 50 degree band when you look at the degrees on the map. So like South Africa, for example, where I am right now is in that same 30 to 50, but it's south of the equator. North of the equator, you have 30 to 50 degree. And Italy, Paris, Germany, they all sit on that same latitude. So almost entire country, the continental U.S., they all sit on that same 30 to 50 degree. So technically, you can make wine in almost any state, in all states in California. Um, California, I mean, not in California, in America. California, however, California produces 90% of the wine in the U.S. market. So 90%. Most of the wine, whenever you talk wine in America, I think you talk California wine right that's what people like it's kind of synonymous although we're going to talk about other regions in the United States that produce wine so um, the United States is the largest wine consumer in the world um, especially during COVID I think <laughs> I think especially during COVID I heard stories of people like walking by the dumpsters like the trash cans in neighborhoods and you just see them filled up with like wine bottles um, so California is winning in the consumption of wine um, and then we're after we're in the top four producers um, so first you have Italy and this this list might have changed since I did this but for in general it stays around the same you have Italy France Spain and then you have the US as far as countries that are producing wine um, like I said this might change a little bit but these are the top four um, you might toggle a little bit between France and Italy, like who's producing more or less in a, in a given year. Um, and then wine is made in all 50 states in the U.S. Now, when we say wine, we don't necessarily mean fine wine made from Vintinus Venera grapes. You can make wine, remember, from anything, from any fruit, but they do make wine in all 50 states in the U.S. Any questions or comments so far? Nope. All right, so let's talk about some of the American wine laws. Our laws are not as strict as laws in France or Italy, thank goodness, right? But we do have some laws that regulate the wine industry. For example, we do have vintage requirements. So the vintage year, for the vintage year to appear on the label, it must be at least 95% of the grapes must be from a particular vintage, right? Um, we have varietal requirements, and this, um, this can change from region to region, right? But for it to be a varietal from that particular grape, you have to have at least 75% of the grapes must be that varietal. The other 25% could be anything. You don't have to necessarily name them, but if you say that it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, you must have at least 75%. In Oregon, Oregon is tough. Oregon is 90%. 90% is the requirement for Oregon. But in general, across the board in America, it's 75%. But when you look at Oregon, Oregon is 90%. And then there's some label requirements. So all the labels must list the alcohol content based on percentage by volume. So when you look at a wine bottle in um, America, it'll say like 14% ALBV, which means alcohol by volume. Um, it must list that the wine contains sulfites. So all wines naturally contain sulfites. Um, so it's weird because when people see this on the label, they think that American wines have more sulfite than European wines. And that's not necessarily true. It's just that our laws require us to put must contain, uh, wine contains sulfites on the label. And then you must have like the Surgeon General warning. And I think this is across the board for all countries. But you might, you have to say like, you know, alcohol can be addictive. It can cause, you know, pregnancy problems and pregnancy and things like that. So we have to have the Surgeon General's warning, whatever it is for that year. So um, anything anybody want to add about that so far? Oh. I just wanted to ask, I thought that that, um, that it was 85%. In Oregon? No, in, well, in California, that it had to be at least 85% uh, to call it a certain varietal. Is no, that could be, regarding I something could, else maybe that I'm no, thinking? No, I could, I could be wrong. So remember, these are my study notes. I'm not like a California wine expert. But like, can somebody Google that right quick? And then we can just find out. Google it and just I'm looking now because I'm working with the I'm working with the winery right now. And we're just releasing. Uh, we're releasing a blend and a cab. And I thought it was 85 percent. 
Yeah, that would be that would be good to know. Like I said, if you see anything that you might disagree with or you might have said, oh, I saw something different, let's talk about it. It's meant to be interactive. Um, so somebody Google that and then we'll get back to it. And so what they call, so in France, they call it ALC when they're trying to like, when they're telling you like the levels of the different wines, right? In America, and then the European just came out with a new EU um, rating system or law system. But in America, we call it the American Appalachian System. Um, and basically, that governs like the laws and the um, AVAs, like the American Viticultural Areas. So basically, like you live in a certain area and you say, you know what, I think that this area is perfect for growing um, certain grapes or, you know, we want to have our own AVA. So you have to submit the paperwork and then that's how you get Napa, you get Sonoma, or you might get um, Napa Valley as opposed to Napa because it's certain AVAs. And so that's what we call our distinct climate and geographical areas. They're called AVAs. Um, and in June 1980, um, Agosa AVA was the first one established in um, America. So that was the first AVA. It was in Missouri. And that was the first AVA in the United States. You wouldn't think about Missouri and American wine most times. Sheila, did you find out the answer yet? It's, it's very convoluted. <laughs> In the article I'm looking at, it is 75%, but there is an issue of 85%. I think it has to do with the vintage or something. I'm, yeah. I'm reading it now. It's a little, it's convoluted. So, it's a it's little somewhere confused. between 75 and 85%. So yeah. you just never know. The point is you can have up to 25% of something else in your wine, up to 15% of something else in your wine when you see Cabernet Sauvignon or you know, Syrah or something like that, because it's not 100%. Um, let's see. And currently there's about, and this might have changed because I know since, since I did this, I know my favorite region, Solvang, was established as an AVA. But currently, or when I did this, there were 240 established AVAs in the United States. And California has the most, with 120. Um... So like I said, this might have changed, but this kind of gives you a rough estimate. Like if you had to take a quiz and name all the AVAs, you would be looking at about 240 to 250 AVAs that you would have to know about. Um, and most of them would be in California. So I think this is kind of repeating what we just said. For it to be for ABA to appear on the wine label, you have to have 80% of the grapes used to produce that wine must be grown in that ABA. So, for example, for it to come from Napa Valley, 85% of the grapes have to come from Napa Valley. If you go to um, one of my favorite ABAs in Napa Valley, would be Spring Mountain. Um, if you wanted it to be Spring Mountain, 85% of those grapes would have to come from that particular ABA. Um, 75% of the grapes in the wine must be grown in that state. California and Oregon require 100% of the grapes to be grown in that state. So for example, if you live in Missouri, you can have 75% Missouri grapes and then you can bring in 25% California grapes and you can still say that it's a Missouri wine. But in California and Oregon, it has to be 100% of the grapes grown in that state for it to have California or Oregon on the label. Um, and I think that that just speaks to how serious California and Oregon treat their wines and how they're trying to keep it pure. Like, and I think that makes sense. You know, if it's California, I want 100% of the, the product to come from California. Um, and then if it comes from multiple, sta multiple states, you can always just say clearly on the label that it's um, bottled or made under multiple states. Let's see. I think somebody, let's see. Oh, is this what you put in? Wait, no, American one. Okay, I'm not going to read all that right now, but we'll come back to that note, Mo. I see it, though. I see it. All right. 
Um, so let's talk about the major regions in California, right? So this is not in order by projection. This is just in order by like, it's just a random order. Um, but you have New Mexico, they produce, um, these are the major regions, New Mexico, New York, Washington, Oregon, and California. So these are the major regions. And of course, we all know Oregon, we all know California, but let's talk about what some some of the grape varietals that are produced in these regions. So New Mexico, let's talk about New Mexico. And just in case we have anybody on the call still that's from um, South Africa, and you need a map, a visual map. This is what America looks like for the most part. Here's the West Coast, where I'm from. Here's the East Coast. Um, if you like rap, I try to tell you, like, think West Side, think East Side, think Biggie Smalls, think Tupac, right? So, um, and then you have the middle. So New Mexico is right here, right next to Texas. Um, it's pretty much on the Western side of the United States, or maybe the middle. But New Mexico, the great varietal that they're really known for with their style is going to be sparkling wine. So one of my favorite sparkling wines there is going to be Gruet and you can get Gruet in almost any um, any wine store in the United States. It's a mass produced wine um, and it's and it's good. It's made in the Champagne wine method um, but some of the other grape varietals that they're producing in New Mexico would be Cabernet Sauvignon of course because that's produced almost everywhere in the world. Um, Zinfandel, Sangiovese, Pinot Noir, and Cap Franc, Cap Franc, and of course Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, um, Chenin Blanc, Riesling, Orange Muscat, and Viognier. So like I said, this is in the southwestern part of the United States. The climate is continental. The soil is rocky. Um, they have dry soils um, like clay, earth. Um, the body of water, because body of water is really important. Remember we talked about that when we were talking about like winemaking and like what it takes to make quality wine. So there's definitely a body of water that's close by and that's going to be the Rio Grande. And if you look at Texas and New Mexico, I think the Rio Grande, if I'm not mistaken, runs right through Texas and New Mexico. Um, don't quote me on my geography though, but it's somewhere up in there, the Rio Grande. Um, and they have over 40 wineries. So not a lot of wineries, but you know, it's, you know, it's enough. And um, like I said, the Gruet is one of my favorite wines from that region and it's super easy to find if you were ever going to do a tasting on American wines. I feel like they export this in a lot of, to a lot of different regions as well. Um, but yeah. Another major region would be New York. So New York is, um, New York is awesome. So um, let's talk about New York. They are very, they're known for, I'm going to say Riesling. When you think about New York, think about Riesling, right? And when you think about New York and you think about wine, please don't think about New York City. Don't think about Manhattan. New York has other areas other than New, um, Manhattan. But they're known for producing sparkling wines, dry wines, and ice wines. So, um, Ice wine is a style of wine where the, the grapes actually freeze and then they squeeze the grapes and they get this really concentrated juice. Um, popular grapes are going to be Riesling, Saval Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cab Franc. So the two most common that are coming out of this region are going to be Riesling and Cabernet Franc. Um, and then Vintinus Venera varieties are less than 10% of the grapes, which is important to know. So like they're making a lot of wines, but not all of them are from these fine wine grapes. Um, so important American hybrid grapes. So when I say Vintinus Venera, those were the Rieslings, the Sauvage Blancs, the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, and the Cabernet Franc. non Vintinus Venera grapes that they're producing, and I've never really heard of any of these. Catawaba, Delaware, Niagara, Alvera, Eves, and Isabella. So it would be interesting to do a tasting on those non-Ventinous Venera grapes, but I have not, I have yet to do that. Um, key facts about it, it's in the northeastern part of the U.S., continental, maritime climate. Um, it's, you, it's pretty cold in this region. So um, the bodies of water that are nearby the Atlantic Ocean, um, you can see the Atlantic Ocean right here, Lake Erie, see it's close to all the three major lakes here. Um, 
the Hudson River, and then the Finger Lakes. So the Finger Lakes is really notable because that's where the Riesling comes from. And when you think about New York wine, um, if somebody asks you about New York wine, you can always refer back to the Finger Lakes region and you can always refer back to Riesling. That's how I kind of like, if you had to pull something out of your hat about New York and wine, I would think Finger, Na Finger Lakes and I would think Riesling. Um, so the notable AVAs, just like I mentioned, Finger Lakes, Hudson River region, Lake Erie, Long Island, and Niagara. The soil, um, so because it's such a cool region and it's right there where like um, they have the glaciers, so they have leftover gravel, they have shale, they have um, heavy types of like clay soils, um, and they have 962 wineries. So wow, they have a lot of wineries in New York. And examples would be, um, this is by brand, but never mind the brand. I mean, this is a good brand though. When I did this class for the students, I was able to like actually bring these brands to them for the tasting. So it was kind of cool because they're all the way in South Africa and they got to taste these wines that not a lot of people get to taste. So I have bought them the Ravens Dry Riesling 2015 from Finger Lakes. Um, but yeah, if you ever have a chance to try some Finger Lakes Riesling, please do so. All right, any questions or comments? Let me just look at the, it's better if you guys just ask your questions because let me see. Nice, okay, cool. And that makes sense because Napa Sonoma, she just put in a comment about 85% refers to Napa and Sonoma because they try to keep you know, everything pretty strict in Napa and Sonoma. Um, okay, so if you guys have questions, just unmute yourself, just ask the questions. Sorry, I don't mean to just run through it so fast. Um, so then we're going to talk about the major wine region, Washington. So when I say Washington, I don't mean like Washington, D.C., I mean like Washington State on the West Coast. So if you look at the map, it's totally up here in the very northwestern corner of the United States. And um, Washington, they're known for producing dry wines, white wines, and red wines. They're known for Riesling, Chardonnay, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. Two of my favorite things that they're producing out of Washington, whenever I try to use examples of um, varietals in the United States, I always point people to Washington for Riesling and for Merlot. Um, ironically, they're resist resistant to phylloxera, so there's no need to um, plant or rootstock due to the sandy soils. So that's important to note. So like during this whole phylloxera scandal, they didn't have any problems because they were all the way in Washington. I just don't think that there were too many people in Washington in Washington State planting wines because I don't think we have went that far up at that time. Um, but until we have another phylloxera outbreak, they don't have to worry about it because they're resistant because of their soil types. Um, let's see, some key facts that we didn't talk about. So the bodies of water. Okay, the Columbia River which they also share with Oregon, um, and then the Pacific Ocean. So those are the, wa the bodies of water that usually moderate the temperature. And then the notable AVAs would be Walla Walla, Columbia Valley, and Yakima. Um, and then the soil, is we talked about the soil, it's mostly sandy, rocky based, alluvial, which is like um, volcanic based, um, basalt, clay, silt, loam, and sandy stone. Um, loam. So they have like a lot of different soil types in Washington. And they have 900 plus wineries. So they have quite a few um, wineries in Washington State as well. Uh, let's see. And then the wine example that I poured for my students was this Eve Chardonnay from Washington State. So. All right, any questions about Washington so far? No? Let's see, okay, cool. So let's talk about Oregon. So Oregon is right under Washington, and I have tasted, I haven't tasted, I haven't went wine tasting in Washington State yet. It's on my, it's on my things to do list, right? But I have tasted in Oregon a couple times, and I love Oregon wines. I love Oregon wine culture. Um, Oregon, they're known for Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris. 
they produce a lot of other grapes there, but like when you think about wine varietals, Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, like they're amazing in Oregon. And so, um, uh, let's see, the climate is maritime, cool climate with lots of rain. Yes, it does. It rains a lot in Oregon. It rains a lot in Washington as well. The notable AVAs are going to be Willamette Valley, Columbia Valley. Now this Columbia Valley, um, Columbia Valley, they actually share a border with Washington. So you can have Columbia Valley, this area, that half of it is in Washington and half of it is in Oregon, which is very, very confusing and interesting at the same time. Dundee Hill, and Umpqua. I'm pretty much probably saying that wrong, but Umpqua Valley. Um, the soil is a combination of mostly um, cemetery and volcanic, and then there's over 725 wineries. So not as many wineries as Washington, um, but 725 is a lot. And then the example that I poured for the students when I was at PYDA was OPP, Other People's Pinot, by a really great winemaker, Andre Mack. And um, it's a perfect example of what Oregon Pinot Noir should taste like. So, all right, so now we are gonna go to the fourth major region, right? So this is like the most important one out of all of them. Um, and this is California. And I don't say that simply because I'm from California. I say it simply because California is known for producing 90% of all the wine that comes from California, um, comes from the United States. You can't think about wine in the United States and not think about wine in California. In California, we're doing everything. So we do dry wines, white wines, red wines, sparkling wines, sweet wines. Um, you name it, we're doing it in California, and some of the major grapes are going to be Chardonnay, Viognier, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Zinfandel, of course, and then Syrah. So all the major wine grapes, we're producing them right there in California. It's on the West Coast. It's a maritime, continental climate. Some areas are semi-desert-like, um, like down in Temecula, down in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is an AVA, actually. Um, and then you have Temecula ABA when you think about the southern parts of California. And that's where you can get those desert-like um, climates. And then the soil, it just depends on where you are because there's, it's, California is so big. California is literally like almost the size of South Africa when you think about it. Um, but you do have a lot of volcanic soils. Um, and the wineries, there's over 1,200 wineries. There's probably more than that, but like there's definitely over 1,200 wineries in California. Um, and then the example that I poured for my students was this classic, classic Charles Krug um, Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley. Um, Charles Krug is like king of Cab in Napa Valley, and it was part of history, so that's what I poured for them. Um, and then I'll also pour an Opolo Zinfandel from Paso Robles. And I did two wines from California just because California is so big and just because I couldn't decide. I wanted to go with the Charles Crew for the history, but then I wanted to go with the Zinfandel because Zinfandel is known as California's grape. So that's why I poured the Zinfandel. Any questions so far before we go more into California? Let me just look at the chat. You guys can always just ask the questions too. All right, so um, there's five major California wine regions, right? And California is so massive, like you can actually just have a class simply on California. You can have a class simply on Napa, but um, we're just gonna do a big overview of California. So when you look at California, you have the, Na the North Coast, which is gonna be Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, um, and Lake County. And then you go down to the Sierra foot. Hills, Amador, Calaveras, El Dorado, Placer, Boots, Yupa, and Mariposa. And then you go to number three, which is going to be the Central Coast, because you're moving down the coast. Um, and that's where you're going to have Monterey, Paso Robles, Santa Cruz, um, Slow, which is San Luis Obispo. And you're going to have Santa Barbara, which is my favorite county. Um, you're going to have SFO and Livermore. So Central Coast is pretty big, and what a lot of people don't realize, the Central Coast is pretty much where most of 
um, California wine comes from. A lot of people think it's Napa Valley, and it's Napa Valley is only responsible for 45% of the wine that comes from California. Most of it comes from this central coast. So all the way from San Francisco, all the way down to Santa Barbara County to about right here. So San Francisco is here, and then all the way down here to like about Santa Barbara County. That's all called the Citro Coast. And then it's like on this side closer to the ocean. Um, and then you have number four, which would be the Central Valley. So the Central Valley is going to be like Lodi. And it's kind of like almost parallel to the Central Coast. Um, but the Central Valley is more inland. It's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a lot more warmer. And so you're going to get different styles of wine in the Central Valley. And the number one grape that they grow in the Central Valley is going to be Zinfandel. You get these really big, beautiful Zinfandels, really deep, rich in color Zinfandels, right, Central Valley. And then you go down to the South Coast. So the South Coast is here where Los Angeles is, right? So Los Angeles all the way down to like San Diego, almost Mexico. And this is, um, you're going to have San Diego County, Temecula. Temecula is very popular. You're going to have Los Angeles County. Um, and in Los Angeles County, you're going to have places like Malibu, um, which a lot of people don't really associate with wine, but they have some really cool wineries in Malibu. You're going to have orange and lime. So those are the five major regions. And then this right here, this is just like all of Napa Valley, right? And so these are all the AVAs that you have in Napa Valley. Like I said, you can spend a whole day talking about Napa Valley. But remember we talked about Stag Sleep? So Stag Sleep, they actually did a whole AVA dedicated to Stag Sleep. So this is Stag Sleep. Um, a good way to think about Napa Valley is you have, you have the coast, you have the mountains, you have the valley floor, right? So when you start to taste Napa Valley wines, think about, did it come from the mountains? Did it come from the coast? Did it come from the valley floor? Because all three of those are going to impart a different flavor profile on the wines. Um, I drink a lot of mountain fruit from Napa Valley. Um, I, I drink a lot of Napa Valley wines because I like Napa floor as well. It just depends on the mood. So for example, if it comes from this place right here in the Napa floor at Oakville, or Rutherford, it's going to be very fruit, very ripe fruit. Um, it's going to be big, um, usually higher in alcohol. But then if you go to here, like how mountain, this is going to be like mountain fruit. So it's going to be a little bit more elegant wines, not as big and ripe. So it's a little bit cooler. It's not as warm as it is on the valley floor. But yeah, that's not before you. That's a whole nother class. Let's go. Um, I think that's all that I have to talk about. Yeah, wait, yeah, so that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we can just kind of talk. If you guys have any questions or anything else that you wanted to add about Napa Valley wines. No questions? No additions? No favorites? In relation to Napa, where is Sonoma? Is it north or... Where is what? Sonoma. Uh, oh, we didn't yeah. even talk. How could we talk about California wines and not talk about Sonoma? <laughs> Sonoma is a little bit north and kind of like parallel in some places. So in some places, Napa and Sonoma actually share a border. Um, let me see if I can just bring up a map so I can show you. It's kind of near Chalk Hill because I'm, I'm working with La Cienega Vineyard and we are like right on the other side of Napa on the hill. So we still have that volcanic soil that you know napa is known for so we have like that you know reserve quality juice nice Wait, but it's so sonoma where are you in you see this map so where is your winery it's can you point it identify it on this map so here's los caneros i know los caneros and um in napa and in sonoma they share a border in some places yeah it's sonoma near chalk Hill. Chalk Hill. Which I don't see. I guess that's yeah, not necessarily an AVA. We'll probably, we'll probably have to bring up another map for that one. But yeah. like, Sonoma, like if you look at here, this is the North mm -hmm. Coast. So Sonoma, just to answer your question, Mo, Sonoma's going to be in the North Coast. So Napa, Sonoma, they're all in here somewhere. Cool. 
Thank you. Like right above San Francisco. And they're kind of like, they, they kind of like, they're super close to each other. Like you literally could drive 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're in Sonoma, and then you're in Napa in some places. Any more questions? Let me see if the Facebook group has any questions. I would love to get um, uh, some tips on good wine, good um, California wines from you that are reasonably priced. Because every time, like every time I go to visit my mom, so she lives in like this teeny, teeny, teeny little um, town in southern New Jersey, where they really they have like you know the liquor stores. It's mostly beer drinkers down there, and they have they always have like the same wines, and it's either like. Uh, and not that expensive or like super, super expensive. There, and there's really like nothing in between. And the prices like compared to what I'm used to spending for like amazing wines here in France are just, they're, I'm like, why? I should just come with no clothes, an entire suitcase of French yeah. wine and just, you, just hang out. You know, you know, I'm all about, well, I'm kind of all about that because I, I, I travel like that. But then at the same time, I think it's worth it to, um, you know, so like if you're in America to buy American wines, right? And to find those. So if you're in New Jersey, and New Jersey is so weird because they have so many weird laws. They do. I think that they have a lot of dry hard. towns. They have a lot of yeah. dry towns. Yeah. And it might be hard for a lot of like really good small producers to actually get their wines to New Jersey. Mm. So if you, um, I would first start with the wine shop that you select, right? Try to find a wine shop that's a small boutique wine shop that's not like your your box grocery store wine shop um, where they have a relationship with small producers because there's so many small producers in the United States, in California, in Napa that a lot of people don't know about and they're making amazing wines and they could be a fraction of the price of your name brand wines, you know what I mean? Because like if mm -hmm. you go, for example, you get a Chateau Montalina, you might be paying for the name. You're not necessarily paying for the juice, you know? You're paying for the name, right. you're paying for that property, that property tax, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you had a smaller producer that was from Napa, then you can find that. I mean, I would just, next time you go to New Jersey, let I me know where you're going to go and okay. I can find a wine shop for you to go to. Okay. I can't necessarily give you any brands, but um, I could, but I'm not sure if they'd be in that wine yeah, shop. Yeah, right, know? exactly. Like, for example, Pride Mountain, because I said I like mountain fruit, right? right. So Pride Mountain is um, one of my favorites, and they make a really amazing Syrah, and they make a really great Cabernet, um, Cabernet Franc, and a Viognier, even. Oh. So did you say Pride know. Mountain? Pride, Pride. P-R-I-D-E, Pride Mountain. Okay. Um, Brown Estates is another one, um, okay. and they're not in the mountains, but they're kind of like in this really cool valley. It's not as warm as the valley floor, okay. so they have big fruit, but then it's also refined, and they make a really good Zinfandel, um, mm -hmm. and they're called Brown Estates. So I can go on with names, but it just depends on the wine shop. So I would look for the okay. shop first, okay. and then once you're in the shop, you can pick Brands. Find a shop. Yeah, find a shop rather than like a liquor store, probably. Like yeah, find a, little a bit shop. More find, yeah, yeah, that has a relationship with these wine mm -hmm. brands. Yeah. I'm looking now to see. Uh, okay, perfect. Frank, oh, so Silas is on Facebook today. He's not on the call. Hi, Silas. We miss you. Yes. And Job Jova, he said that for table wine and brandy. Oh, and he said that he just made a comment. He said that New York is known for hybrid grapes and they, they're used for table wines and brandy production. So like, that's interesting. I would love to try some brandy from New York. Uh -uh. Thank you, Joe. Job. I'm not sure how I say your name. All right. Any other questions or any other comments about like American wine? I don't even know if we finally um, Sheila, you sent a lot of information in the text about like how you, um, how they identify like the varietal and the region. So did we finally say that in Napa, 
it has to be 85% of the grapes have to be that same varietal for it to be a varietal, right? Whereas in the United States in general, it's 75% except for Napa, Sonoma, and Oregon, where it's 80, no, Oregon is 90%, but Napa, Sonoma is 85%. So yeah, I think we're all clear on that. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Nope. Okay, so then we will let it, we will end it at 45 minutes or 50 minutes after. Thanks so much for joining you guys. Um, we're going to come back next week with a guest speaker. Um, I'm trying to find somebody who makes barrels because I want us to talk oh. to somebody who's a barrel maker. Do you, did you need help trying to get through? Because I gave you some contacts for that. Did you need yeah, me to like contact I, someone? I, you want me to I, try I, to get I, through to someone? Yeah, could you? Maybe I speaking know. French might help. <laughs> that might, because they probably saw my American and they were like, no, we don't speak American. Bye. Can you send me, <laughs> can you send me the information again? Because I'm not sure I have what I sent you. The names of the, yeah. of the barrel or makers. Or maybe, yeah, I will send it to you. California you could do that. I'll, I can give them a call if you want. Try to get in touch with them, and uh, yeah, that would be that would be amazing because I think it would be awesome to just have like you know I just want us to okay. learn about yeah. every single part of the wine mm -hmm. making process. That'd be so cool. a barrel maker would be awesome. Will you show? I I don't know if I can't remember if you said it, but did you? Will you share your slides from today with us or? Yeah, I will. I can either share them right now or I can just okay. email them to you. What do you prefer? Okay. I can put them in there. Whatever's easiest. Whatever's easiest. I'll That's just okay. email them to you. Yeah. And, um, and can I put in a plug for Friday, Safari Sips? Yes. For of course. Bou Bouchard in Les Ans, So we go back to South Africa. Yeah. We're doing a, we're doing a Zoom, Zoom slash live tasting with uh, Chris Albrecht, who I met virtually through you. So That's he's awesome. Gonna, and since the world is open, I can actually go buy a couple You can go. Time. Get, get right, them. Get, get the 2017 um, Mission Vale, uh, Kaiman's Hut, and um, Galpin Peak, or whatever one of those. But um, the 2017. What, 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 what varietals are those? Um, Galpin Peak is Pinot Noir. <sighs> I can't wait. <laughs> uh, Mission, and Mission Vale and the Crocodile's Lair are both the Chardonnays. Nice. Um, okay. So, so I'm probably not going to get three bottles because that's a lot no, for me. No, that's, to yeah. Out, but I probably will get the Pinot Noir and taste the Pinot. Yes, uh, I can't um, wait. So, Safari so Sips check on Safari Sips, Sips on, I don't know how they, um, on Facebook. Tasting, I'll just write it. Tasting with um, Bouchard Finaison. And if you haven't joined her page, please join her page, Safari Sips. We do, we do Friday tastings um, and presentations with uh, South African you know, wineries. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been such, a, such an adventure. It's so fun. And what time do you guys sit? It's, um, it'll be 7.30 Cape Town time, which is the same time as Paris, which is nice. I love it. I love being in the same time zone. Just, just fly 10 hours, but you're still in the time zone. Um, and it's, so we're doing the, um, yeah, the, the Chardonnay and um, Pinot Noir. Yay. Um, Pinot Noir, and Chris is so, he's so sweet. Okay, he is, he is so sweet. I'm definitely gonna jump in and say hi to him. So Safari Sips on Friday, and then we'll be back on Tuesday. Tuesday, our deductive tastings are going so well. There's so much fun on Tuesday. Um, on this Tuesday coming up, I think we are tasting Syrah. I think okay. so. Ooh, another another favorite. Final decision? Yes, it's Syrah this week, and then next week is for worst demeanor. Who votes to the Mina? Yes, thank you, Monica, because I was a little tipsy. We had drank so much. But any we, Syrah? Huh? Any Syrah? Any Syrah from any yeah, country? So, any yeah, so how it works. Any Syrah from any country. We encourage different country Syrahs. We encourage different type of regions. And so what happens is we had somebody from, we have Silver who called in, and she's from the U.S., Okay. And so she, she brings in different wines because she's easy, it's easy for her to get international wines. So this past week, she had a French 
She had a French Viognier. And then we had um, Takura. He was from Zimbabwe. I think he had a South African wine, but he had one that was a Viognier that was from, um, was it a warm region? Or was it? Um, it was a cool Lalo. coastal. It was cool it was coastal, I think. Cool coastal region. Lalo. And Lalo, he had a, a wine that was from a warm region. So it's fun because we go through this seductive tasting and we like, right, we like go through all the notes of how each wine tastes. And you can hear the difference. You can't taste it. Right. Oh, wow. But you can hear somebody describe their wine that's from a cooler region or from France or a wine that's from California or a wine that's from South Africa. You can hear the difference in the characteristics. Oh, so excellent. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So Sierra so on Tuesday and Gewurztraminer on Thursday. No, we oh. do it only on Tuesday. So oh, it's only on Tuesday. Sierra okay. this Tuesday and then Gewurztraminer the following Tuesday. Got it. Okay. Yeah, but it's so much fun. We had so much fun tasting and we encourage everybody to just grab any new bottle of Syrah and just the only thing that we do ask is that you make sure that it's like um not 100% but at least you know it says Syrah on the bottle so we don't want to blend we want like a true varietal 100% that varietal all right mm -hmm. so see you guys on Tuesday and then next Thursday we'll be back with the special guest Tuesday is at six o'clock and then next Thursday is at 12 noon again Okay. Tuesday at six o'clock, South African. Your mm -hmm. time in South Africa. Okay. Yes, Sheila. I'm actually trying to put together a tasting group for the U.S. I'm just trying to get my life together. It's a lot trying to do. Both <laughs> Tuesday. Both. Wait a second, Tuani. So Tuesday, and then we can like carry on with sisters who sip <laughs> for people who want to. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to, and I was gonna come to sisters who sip, but then. Our detective tasting lasted so long, was, and then after on. that, we started, yeah. taste, we started talking about J9 wines because they were at my house tasting with us. So uh -huh. it just became this big event, and it was amazing, but yeah. Oh, fun. Okay. All right. So you guys have a good one. It was so awesome to catch up with you guys. I will share the slides with you guys. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for all of this. This is great. Mo, it was so good to see you again. And by Celis, Celis is watching on Facebook. So it's so good. I'm so glad to have you guys join every week. Great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.